So welcome everyone. We are very excited for today's special reading from the newly released anthology from the farther shore, discovering Cape Cod and the islands through poetry. Published by Bass River Press in collaboration with Calliope Poetry and edited by Alice Cochemba, Robin Smith Johnson and Rich Yeomans. The expansive collection includes the work of 118 contemporary poets who have been stirred by the unique beauty, history, and heritage of Cape Cod, Massachusetts, and the islands. From the native Wampanoag tribes who survive to this day, pilgrims and whalers, from artists to cranberry growers and pickers, lighthouses to seafood shacks and dune shacks and the gorgeous national seashore. Together, the editors note the poems meld the outer and interior landscapes and work together to create a true sense of place. And information about purchasing the anthology, which would make a wonderful holiday gift, um, I wasn't asked to say that, will be in the chat box. And before I introduce the editors and the host of today's reading to you, I just want to remind you of the next New England Poetry Club virtual reading, new poetry reading with Susan Eisenberg, Julie Danho, and Beth Kress on Sunday, November 14th, 3 to 5 p.m. There'll be a Q&A and open mic will follow the featured readers. And we also have our monthly writing workshop this Tuesday, October 26th from 7 to 9 p.m. for NEPC members and you can check our website for more information on these events. So today's reading will begin with the editors of From the Farther Shore, Alice Cochemba, Robin Smith Johnson, and Rich Yeomans, all well known in the Cape's literary community. Alice Cochemba, today's host, is founding director of Calliope Poetry and the author of Born Bridge, Turning Point 2016, and was guest editor of Common Threads, the poetry discussion project of Mass Poetry 2015 and 2016. Robin Smith Johnson teaches at Cape Cod Community College and is the author of two books of poetry, Dream of the Antique Dealer's Daughter, Word Poetry 2013, and Gale Warnings, Finishing Line Press 2016, as well as co-founder of the Steep Street Poets in Mashpee. Rich Yeomans is the Editor-in-Chief of Contemporary High Boon Online, as well as the Associate Director of Calliope Poetry. His books include Under a Gull's Wing, Poems and Photographs of the Jersey Shore, co-edited with Frank Finale, and Shore Stories, an anthology of the Jersey Shore, both published by Down the Shore Publishing. So welcome and many thanks to Alice, Robin, and Rick. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, can everyone hear me okay? Good. <laughs> well, welcome everyone. We appreciate so much you coming out today and to the New England Poetry Club, thank you. Um, we really, we're so happy to be here, be able to celebrate the book. Um, just gonna start off very briefly, just with a little bit of background on the book and also some thank yous. Um, as Jennifer mentioned, the book itself is a collaboration between Calliope Poetry, which Alice co-founded back in 2006 and for many years ran a series of excellent readings and workshops. And I know that several of you participated in them over, over time. And also uh, Basher of Press, which is an imprint of the C Cape Cod Cultural Center. And we really need to thank the Basher of Press the Cultural Center. They did a great job. And particularly thank Lauren Walk. Lauren is the editor of Basher of Press. And she, she designed a book. She got, that, she got that wonderful cover art from Eric Moquin, uh, the local artist that we were talking about earlier, which we'll, we'll see again later on. And she was really a partner every step of the way. And Alice, Rob, and I, we all very much appreciate it. So when the three of us began this book, um, we knew we wanted to get beyond, you know, what people typically 
you think of, I think with Cape Cod and Martha's Vineyard and Nantucket, you know, sort of like that, what we, what we would call like the surf, sun and fun aspect where people think of it as a great place for vacation. And what we wanted to do was to really present Cape Cod and the islands in all of its facets, um, to get its history and heritage. And to do that, we all sat down, we started writing out all the things that we had hoped, we would hope to include in the book. Uh, historical episodes, famous people who visited Cape Cod and the islands, uh, local landmarks, indigenous industries. And at the end, we had do dozens of topics that we called touchstones. And as we began the selection process, um, we would refer to these touchstones time and again, to make sure we tried to capture as many as, as possible. And I'm prejudiced, of course, but I think we did. We didn't get everything, but we got a, we got a lot. And when we did the call for submissions, we had a thousand, a thousand poems from all over the country. And it was quite the job, really great poems getting down to the 118 that appear in the book. Uh, but, you know, those touchstones helped us. And I just have to say thank you to all the contributors uh, because we were all so impressed with the quality of the work and just how well they captured what we were hoping to capture about with, with the Cape and the Islands. So I'm gonna begin with just reading two, two of my poems that appear in the book. And like I said, we were trying to get as many aspects of the Cape as possible, including history. And with the, um, in the beginning of the book, there's a section called Origin Stories. And this first poem I'm gonna read is going to really, really go back to the origins, back to the Ice Age, uh, to the time when the Laurentide ice sheet came down and pulled back and left the, left the landmass that we now call the Cape, Cape and the Islands. And this first poem I'm going to read is called Dome Rock. Uh, it's, a, it's a glacial erratic in East Ham, Massachusetts, named after one of the first settlers to the Cape. And it's the largest exposed boulder on Cape Cod. It's now in the, in the Cape Cod National Seashore. This is Doan Rock. Taller than three men, its granite face all lumps and ridges, folds and furrows, as if formed by a hand that once held the sun. Shadowed by pitch pine and oak, sunk deep as an eye tooth into the sandy soil, into layers of gneiss and gabbro and diorite, debris of an ice sheet that pushed and scoured and tugged this terrain into a spit that now arcs like a shaking fist. Think of it. 20,000 years ago, the Laurentide creaked and cracked southward, carrying a cargo of boulders from Canada and the Gulf of Maine, then retreated, leaving nothing but upheaval. Moraines and their erratic mounds, outwashed plains braided by meltwater, ice chunks sunk into the soil like death charges and half buried boulders shouldering into sunlight. Like this one, which inhabits space so thoroughly that everything moves around it, slows to a glacial pace. I reach out to touch its coarse face, its topography of lichen, its moist hollows. I press my palm into its ancient ruts and for a moment am in a time when ice cleaved the earth when sun splintering white filled the eye and sang as if in chains. And this second poem I'm going to read, um, one of the things we wanted to do was also make sure we included obviously the, the original residents of the Cape and the islands. Um, there are now two federally recognized tribes, tribes in Massachusetts, the Mashpee Wampanoag and the Wampanoag of Gayhead, which is now Aquina. And the Mashpee Wampanoag, they have a great story in that um, they actually brought back the Wampanoag language. And it was spearheaded by uh, a local woman, Jessie Little Doe Baird, who actually, she had had dreams once of these ancestors who were speaking in a tongue that she just didn't understand. So she finally realized it was the original Wampanoag language. And she, with um, a professor from MIT and others in the tribe, um, they researched and they actually brought back the language itself. It had been spoken in 150 years, and this was the first time this had ever been done. And Robin 
Smith Johnson, she wrote some excellent notes at the back of the book to really flesh out some of the poems. And I'm going to read a little bit from the note that she wrote um, because the, it was called the Wampanoag Language Reclamation Project, it began in 1993. And it was based in part on a 1663 Bible that had been translated into Wampanoag, as well as other legal doc documents that were written in the language, which were basically land transfers. And in, uh, in Jesse Little Doe Baird's testimony to the U.S. Senate Committee on Indian Affairs, she noted that one of the Wampanoag words, the punisham, means both I have fallen down and I've lost my land rights, that my feet have been removed from me. And for the Wampanoag, the land was not separate from the body and the land and language were also inextricably linked. So the poem I'm gonna read, um, that wrote was called This Language, This Blood, This Land. And it begins with an epigraph by Jesse Lil Dobear to the commission. My blood and bones come from the very land that you know as Mashpee. This language resides deep in our blood these nouns move and breathe like bucks in green brush or stay still as pond water absorbing sky. This language once delivered Genesis, the Bible's stern tales and showed the theft of fertile land when a tribe lost its footing and fell down and now rises again after the dreams in which the old voice has called for a new generation to reconnect with why the pines stay green, with the breath of cattail reeds, with this language that falls from the tongue like starlight of centuries past onto a land that is us. So thank you everyone. And with that, I'm gonna pass it along to, to Robin next. Hi, it's so nice to be here. Hopefully you can hear me. Um, good. <laughs> I think as I was listening to Rich reading his poems, I was thinking that one of the magical qualities about this book is the vision that the poets have of what Cape Cod is, and I, also the islands. And we were um, given um, an extra lease on life with an, with an extra year of getting the book ready due to the pandemic. So what at first seemed like, um, you know, something that was going to really um, upset our progress turned out to be a good thing. And as Rich mentioned, I spent a few months um, compiling notes for the back of the book because we felt that it was important that readers could dive a little deeper into the history and the background of the place and the people that make up um, Cape Cod. So I'm not going to talk at length, but I did want to read two short poems and then hand it over to Alice. And um, the subject of this poem is now um, a young man, but the title is My Son at Four Walking South Cape Beach. Gathering shells in late spring is a small task, each tucked in his palm some to be stored away in the blue bucket, others thrown back. No one had to show him the art of discerning one from another, conch, razor, slipper shell, even the curious half light, sun hidden by a sudden cloud, illuminates that moment of decision, what catches his eye, what means. And the second poem was inspired by, um, for many years I worked at the Cape Cod Times as their newsroom librarian. So on my lunch break, I was out and about, usually walking down by Hyannis Harbor. And that experience um, influenced the writing of this poem called Gale Warnings, Hyannis Harbor. Wind and rain blow misgivings into the faces of strangers struggling with umbrellas down Main Street. At the harbor under a sunken sky, gulls squall over white caps swept aside in salt air. Skiffs rise and fall in the wake of a departing ferry. Lines creak against the pilings. There's a smell of fish and brine. The rain quickens. 
the edges of things bleed outside the frame. This is how a poem enters, by making silence larger. Thank you. And now I'll turn this over to Alice. Well, thank you, Robin. And um, that extra year gave some of us time to write new poems. I know Robin did one on um, Elmer Crowell, the um, bird carver, and I did one, uh, an ekphrastic poem, Homage to the Patricia Marie, which was a response to Salvador Del Deo's painting um, that um, was about the tragedy for the Provincetown fishing community. And that's in the book, but since I've been reading that poem a lot lately, I'm gonna just read two poems that really are about the approach to the Cape. Um, the first section of the book is called To the Cape. And the book starts with Stanley Kunitz's you know, iconic Route 6. And of course, um, I had this urge that of course the book should start with my poem, Born Bridge, because you know I have aspirations to be a US Poet Laureate. But uh, we sensibly decided to the other two editors that that really wasn't the right way to go. The middle poem in that um, uh, first section is by Lindsay Knowlton, who recently moved from Vermont down to Massachusetts. And um, her poem is such a, a time capsule. And some of us who are old enough to remember before the highway went to the Bourne Bridge. You go through the towns and it's told from the child's perspective of anticipation and that sort of sticky feeling you have when you're stuck in a, the backseat of a car. Um, but it's a very charming poem. And if you um, have the book, I really suggest reading it. It's, it. it's something that I read at the West Falmouth Library when we did one of our in-person readings. So here's my poem, Born Bridge. Not the hard rain the rivers crave, not the downpour to quench the forest floor, just a light mist on almost empty roads as I'm entombed in gray, the only sound an intermittent shush, wipers clearing windshield. This quiet is pleasing, a monochromatic alone, when suddenly the overcast lightens from charcoal to dove, then splits into strands of mauve salmon rose, and the bridge ahead luminous, wrapped in a pale blue shawl. Each raindrop clings, glistening in pure light that's always there, even when hidden, I've come home. And then the second poem, I'll just read two of my own. And at the very end, um, if time allows, I'll come back and read the final poem in the book is by Mary Oliver, which is called Coming Home. So it's sort of a bookend about what home means whether you come seasonally or you live here. So this is um, set in Tea Ticket, which some of you might not know, is a little village of Falmouth. And um, it's sort of a, a, a very gritty little part of town, which is one of my favorite parts of town. And um, this is a story about a, a hardware store. Death of Tea Ticket Hardware. I never knew his name nor he mine. He was always there, patient, polite, shy. I never knew the name of what I needed either, but he did after listening. You know that thingamajig that connects the hose to the washer? I need the innards of a lamp. He'd find it in a flash through overcrowded aisles so narrow only a munchkin could maneuver. In the back of the store on the dusty top shelf, where what's its live? And he'd tell me how to use it, and he'd tell me again. Drawing it on a little scratch pad he kept at the register, not the electric kind, next to the dish of pennies and the bowl of lollipops. I would always leave with a red one and confidence. He was the kindest man in town. I imagined he went home at 5.30 every night to the apartment above the store and told his wife over meatloaf and mashed potatoes 
green beans and pecan pie. That lady came in again today, seems bright enough, but doesn't even know a lamp has a socket. And he'd smile when she would say, oh, Mrs. Dimwit, and they would turn on the news at six. The drive to town is eerie now, the tea ticket hardware is gone. Boarded up windows stare like a zombie whose soul's been stolen by Walmart. Peter Cabral, son of John, son of Peter, son of John. I never said hello or goodbye or thank you. Thank you. And so we're going to um, go straight to our readers. And I'm sure you all unmute and then mute when you're finished. As I am now going to say the first poet's name is, please welcome Barbara Crooker. Barbara. Thank you. And thank you so much for including me in this beautiful book. I love it. Um, when I was a child, we came from upstate New York um, and stayed at Pilgrim Village in Chatham every year. So Cape Cod is part of my childhood memories. And then as my parents grew older, they rented a house in Harwichport with some of their friends. And the first trip I took with my mom, we were returning my dad's ashes there. So that's the subject in, in some ways of my poem, which I'm gonna read with a little bit of sadness because this is about Bonnet's Bakery, which isn't there. The rambling house that my parents rented with their friends at the end of that street isn't there. It was torn down for a McMansion and the place is all posted with no trespassing signs. So the last time I was there, when I read for you at Calliope, I wanted to walk on the beach and talk to my parents and couldn't. Eating meltaways in Harwichport. It's been four years since my father died and it seems like I'm becoming him, driving my mother to this sandy spit where we vacation with their friends of 30 years go to thrift shops and lobster roll lunches at the white congregational church, admire the blue hydrangeas bobbing along the picket fence. This year, death's been busy as a surf caster on a moon-filled night, blues and stripers running wild, reeling them in one after another. Dottie, talking on the phone, Merrick, dozing in his recliner, Cancer's heavy weather, taking Jean and Claire, and only mom and I remain. We're sitting in our favorite restaurant, stirring sugar in iced tea, hearing the little cubes tinkle like wind chimes. I wanna skip the next chapter, stay here like this, life rolling on, predictable as morning fog or thick milky chowder, the sun, a pat of butter melting through. Our waitress in a white apron and pink uniform, her name scrolled on her left breast, waits with a pad of paper. The meltaways just came out of the oven, she says. Can you smell them? I can put them in a box if you don't have room for now. Well, thank you, Barbara. Uh, I think Barbara heard that I read that poem on WCAI when we were first promoting the book. And a friend of her told her even before I said, oh, we've accepted your poem. And she was so gracious that how she found out about it is through a friend. But, you know, I love that poem. It's one of my favorites. And um, as we go down, if there are poets who have more than one poem in the book, please read. Um, all the poems that you want to read. Um, our next poet is Frank Finale. Frank. Frank, you're muted. Thanks, Jim. Can you hear me? Yep. Yes. Okay. 
All right, the acronym is MBL. Most of you who come from Massachusetts would know that. Uh, it means uh, the Marine Biological Laboratory. And just for the fun of it, I put three of Rachel Carson's titles from books in the poem, one right in the title of the poem. At the Edge of the Sea with Rachel Carson. Woods Hole, summer of 29. A delightful place to biologize, you declare in a letter to a friend. Woods Hole, where you came magnum, magna cum laude, to the red brick MBL. A town where one can't walk very far in any direction without running into water. Today, I sit by the bronze statue of you, staring out to sea, a sense of wonder in our gaze. Your mother taught you to look at nature closely, to walk in a sea of woods, to feel the trees, the fairyland lichen, to smell the soil in different months, nudged you to look up on a summer night at millions of stars that blazed in darkness. In sea wind, you wrote books that sailed to faraway places with their cargo of words. Now I sit with you before the town awakens. Fishing boats nudge the wooden docks. Vineyard sound sparkles with miniature suns. Gulls sail and cry. I draw a deep breath, lift my eyes in praise. That's it. Thank you, Rich, Alice, and Robin for doing this book yeah. so I can revisit without having to go all the way. <laughs> <laughs> well, and we certainly remember you, you know, when you'd come to visit and we would go down and uh, have lunch and look, and, uh, look out at the water. It's beautiful. Yeah. So, thank you. And Frank's from New Jersey. So our next poet to read is a Melbourne Poetry Club member, and it's Jeffrey Harrison. Jeffrey. Uh, thank you for including this poem. This is a very old poem written long before I lived in Massachusetts um, about sailing to Cuddyhunk with my um, future wife and future parents-in-law. Uh, so there really isn't much in here um, beyond description. I think if I were going to write this poem now, I might include some human interaction in it, but um, so, so Cuddyhunk, as you probably know, is, is one of the Elizabeth Islands. Um, so this is called Returning to Cuddyhunk. Also, there's a windmill referred to. Some of you might remember the windmill on Cuddyhunk, which isn't there anymore. Returning to Cuddyhunk. I've heard half a dozen meanings for the name and none of them alike. To me, it always seemed a baby's nickname for a baby island a low scruffy hill on the horizon, so small it looks as if the windmill on it might lift it off the ocean like a seaplane. That day the Sunday globe sent, said it meant go away and I believed it. I thought they must have turned the windmill on like an electric fan, a wind machine that blew the white caps off the green reptilian waves into our faces. We gave up and tacked into Sakonet. After the storm blew over, we tried again. We spotted Cuddy Hunk. At first, the cliffs of Gay Head looked like part of it. The windmill stood there in the middle without waving its arms and stared at us inscrutably. The Gosnold monument was over to the right, like a lonely chess rook in its corner, waiting for the most strategic moment to castle with the windmill king. The harbor on the other side looked like a plate full of hors d'oeuvres bristling with toothpicks. Then we saw the gray monopoly sized houses. When we sailed past tiny treeless penachies, a former leper colony 
and now a bird sanctuary. The ways were so smooth, more like a lakes than an ocean's. It was as if the thinnest film of mist were on them, softening the blues and oranges of sunset. We docked near the fish shacks, then walked up the road between two blooming hedges. The island took us in its arms, privet, milkweed, honeysuckle, multiflora rose. The evening air seemed hazy from the pollen. I said, it's happening, the island's taking off. We walked along a dry stone wall with orange lichen on it, like spilled paint, dried and cracked, and passed a little church whose weather vane was a striped bass, wide-eyed and open-mouthed, as if astonished by the clouds above him, which looked like pink cabbages in a blue field. Thanks. Well, thank you, Jeffrey. Actually, when I read that poem the first time and now hearing you read it, I feel like I'm there. It's okay. wonderful what po poetry can do. And I hate to say it, I've never been to Cuddy Hunt. Because I get terribly seasick, so trying to get anywhere that's an island is a challenge. But it was a wonderful uh, treasure to have that poem in the book. Well, thank you so much for including it. And the next poet, um, I get a chance to meet in Truro. And it's, um, you all know her pretty well from the New England Poetry Club, Linda Haviland Conte. Linda? Hi, thank you so much. This first poem is about the seals around here, which at one point were hunted nearly to extinction, which you could hardly believe now because they're everywhere drawing the sharks, but they're so delightful. Chatham seals at South Beach. Every 15 minutes or so, a gang of them, seven or eight together, patrols our chosen spot at the beach. From the safety of the waves, each Atlantic gray trains two round dark nostrils and matching soulful eyes on us and lingers to make out whether we are one of them. They have little of the timidity of forest creatures. We expect they'll shimmy up to introduce themselves shortly, announcing the connection we've forgotten. But without warning, they slip down the beach to their next patrol point from the water. They'll haul out on a private beach, officiously laying claim to prime napping property, blubbery back to bosom, forming with kin a great oily raft of wriggle and snort. So that's the seals. And this is um, about my, my favorite beach walk at Harding's Beach, Harding's Beach. We'll go to the Cape today and walk again to the lighthouse. Almost nothing's there but the trail and sky and glimpses of the sea. Parts of the trail are rough and pebbly and parts let your feet sink into drifts like powdery snow. Hardy scrub may be blooming along the way dusty miller, rose hips, and purple vetch. Some grand cottages on the rise beyond the creek will stare at us in their leisure as we work out our worries on the trail. We'll make it all the way to the lighthouse where Chatham Road's channel meets Stage Harbor and watch the sailboats and fishing vessels come and go. We'll return by the breezier Nantucket Sound if it's sunny and getting hot. We'll come home feeling well used and in possession of a plan, even if it's only dinner in town. We've sloughed off the old skin of our feet so many times on that trail. It will know us when we return. Thank you. Uh, so Linda, I must admit that, you know, we really wanted poems about Chatham and the Chatham seals. It was so wonderful. We thought we'd get more poems about sharks, but we actually got a little more poems about whales than, than any other critter on the Cape. So, um, but we were very, uh, very glad to have both of your Chatham poems. And the, the beach walk, the, the idea that you could actually choose which and whether which way to walk back, that's such a lovely detail. 
So thank you. Thank you. And the next poet um, is uh, uh, from Cape Cod, but she's also from New Orleans. Um, so um, it's Lorna Noble's book, Lorna. I think you have to unmute Lorna. Yeah. There we go. Um, thank you so much for including me both in the anthology and in the, the this reading and, and other readings. It's been such a pleasure to hear the poems in person and, and virtually. Um, I, uh, I do live both in Cape Cod and New Orleans. In, in Cape Cod, we live in Brewster, which is, as we tell people, the inside of the elbow. For those who aren't familiar with Cape geography, it's a useful anatomical way to describe where we are. Um, we like to kayak here on the bay, but we have to time it carefully with the tides. Otherwise, um, it can be a little dicey. So this is called On Quivet Creek. We were not quite lost that Sunday morning two hours of high tide left as the water began its alchemy from salt to mineral, luring us into bosky silence. Small choirs in the pine trees, a breeze ruffling the cord grass, waves slapping against the shore. Each turn compelled us farther. We let ourselves go with the water, forward. Without charts, the looping ribbon of creek became both route and destination. Houses tucked into the marsh drows behind drawn shades, indifferent to us. Shorebirds ignored us, busy with their own tasks and hungers. And past the last bend, or the next to last, past the osprey nesting station, just before the cemetery, bells rang. And if you were to die today or leave me, if memory is all we ever have of eternity, this is the moment I choose to remember, a green hereafter of sunlight and peeling bells. Paddles raised, kayaks slowly pirouetting in the sun, we floated, listening long after the last echo's faint splash until the tide carried us on its backward journey to the bay. Um, and as Alice mentioned, we, we do uh, split our time between Cape Cod and New Orleans, two places our friends often joke will not be in existence in uh, 10 years time if, if global warming continues at its current pace. Um, but other than this, this past year during the pandemic where we, we sheltered on Cape Cod, but in other years we have had the ritual of um, closing up the house and taking off for our other coast. Um, so this poem is called Wash Ashores. Uh, we have been Wash Ashores now for 20 years, but I understand that it's a lifelong condition. Um, you're never not a Wash Ashore once you are one. Um, so this is called Wash Ashores and it's uh, right on, it has a, a place, it's located at Saints Landing in Brewster, Massachusetts, right by our house. September and the gardens blown and bolted. Wren and Finch have flown south and the sun sets farther down the bay each passing night. We hate the thought of leaving, contemplate alternatives, as if this bright and ample season could endure beyond the calendar's secure curfew. But Labor Day is here, and autumn is ready to sue for possession. What do we do? Procrastinate, then pack and go. My books, your music, lit in clothes, and one more summer is foreclosed upon by rituals such as these. Stacking canoes and wicker chairs, arguing over small repairs, required by weather or the years. Where is the pulse of a home? What is the soul of a house? That marriage of dwelling and spirit. Perhaps it's in the flow of tide, a herring gull's suspended glide, the constant bird song in the shade, reminding us, you are, you are. Then, just before we load the car, the house fills with the airy fire of sunset, and we shroud the place in bedding, a green sprigged embrace of percale and flannel and fleece. Is it love, I wonder, when we're done? 
or time we're shielding from the sun beneath these sheets that we slept on. Thank you so much. Oh, those lovely poems. Um, uh, yes, being a wash ashore, I've been here 30 years, which is just about half my life. And uh, people say, where do you live? But if they say, where are you from? I always say Boston. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but the sense of place that you capture in both those poems, um, especially you know, anybody who's had to pack up a house. And I can't believe that you, you do it twice a year. Never mind. <laughs> uh, that's, that's quite the challenge. It's a good problem to have. <laughs> it is. Um, so um, the next poet um, I recently met, and it's Maxine Sussman. Maxine. Oh, hello, Alice and Rich and Robin. Thank you for this beautiful book. And um, it's wonderful to be among so many other poets who love the Cape. I I live in New Jersey, but um, I've been coming to the Cape since I was a little girl and I brought my own kids here and my husband and I come up every summer. Um, and when I'm not there, I think about it an awful lot. So the poem that I wrote for this book is called Henry Beston's Outermost House, 1927. There's a, a really good note in the back that tells you a little bit about Henry Beston, if you aren't already familiar with him, but um, he uh, he he served in World War One. He saw some really horrific things, and uh, then uh, some years later, he came to the Cape and built and lived in a dune shack on uh, Coast Guard Beach for a year. And he wrote about about it in his book, which became a classic of American nature writing. Um, and um, the shack was uh, destroyed in the blizzard of 78. It's not there any longer. Uh, so here's uh, the poem. Henry Beston's Outermost House, 1927. He builds his dune shack on the bluff above the marsh, the edge a few feet off with views of open sea, walks the beach all weather, seasons, all times of day and night, miles to town, carrying food home in a rucksack across Nosset. After driving an ambulance in France, Verdun, the ocean's onslaughts, the pounding storms and battery of gales hit pure, not like waves of dead and dying men. Shipwrecks on the outer cape claim mere dozens at a time. A year living alone, witnessing, then returning to his shack to hone sentences like calligraphy, chiseled on sand when tide flows out. A whole chapter turned over to nothing but ocean sounds for pages and pages, various as the flight patterns of birds. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Maxine. We were obviously really hoping for a poem about the outermost house and Henry Beston. Um, and we're so glad we have yours in the book. Um, and our next poet is really all the way from Hawaii. So this is the advantage of Zoom. Um, so welcome, Joseph Stanton. Hello, I've actually uh, spent a lot of time on, uh, when I do go to Cape Cod, searching for Edward Hopper houses and kind of looking for the place. Actually, they're hard to recognize now because the trees have so overgrown and so forth and so on. I've also spent time, I worked on a book on uh, Edward Gorey. So I spent some time at Gorey House and work with those people. Uh, the poem that I did for that's in this book is um, uh, based on a drawing by Edward Hopper. And Hopper, uh, at least this drawing was preserved with his color notes written on it so that he you know, would do a sketch and then he would uh, note what colors he was going to use. So I thought this was uh, rather a fascinating uh, glimpse at Hopper thinking about what he was trying to do when he was painting the painting. The painting is Route 6 Eastham. And uh, so this poem is Edward Hopper's color notes for Route 6 Eastham. After Hopper designed a scene, he'd plan his colors. His notes for this picture place pale green on one wall, 
pale warm gray on another, pale lavender on still another. His shadows tumble in one direction as dark warm lavender and as cold shadow in another. All he wanted, he once said, was to paint sunlight on the side of a building. Here we see him flicking on Cape Cod light one color at a time. Thank you. Great to be included in this book. Thank you. Thank you. We, we of course, wanted a poem about um, Hopper, and we have one in the book about Edward Gorey. So really, you know, it was, it, you know, when Rich talked about the touchstones, every once in a while you couldn't see us, we were hopping up and down saying, yes, we got the poem that we were hoping for. So thank you so much. Um, and I really want to give a warm welcome to the next poet who uh, valiantly has gotten on Zoom for us today. And uh, we reached out to Gail Mazur and asked for some poems because we know she had um, deep roots in Mashpee, but also uh, lives in Provincetown. And um, so we have some poems by Gail Mazur. So Gail. Um, I think you have to unmute. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, and thank you for including me. I'm just, I keep losing parts of my pages. So I might just be able to read one. Now, here it is. Um, yes, I spent the first almost 50 odd years of my life as a, as a Mashby person. So when, when I was a child in Mashby, the Wampanoags were the town and they were the structure, the political structure of the town and the social structure of the town. And it, it wasn't that I felt like a wash ashore, it felt like I was sort of allowed into this history that, that as a child, I really, really um, revered. And it was um, also where my parents lived in the woods, there were several um, Wampanoag graves, but graves of um, what they call praying Indians, you know, with the willow and urn symbol on them. And I felt like they were somehow they were secret and they were my my responsibility. And then one day in, in my 50s, my husband and I had been invited to visit the Fine Arts Work Center in Provincetown. And it was cold and, you know, April on the Cape isn't its, it isn't its most beautiful month. But we so fell in love with it that, that we switched allegiances from the Upper Cape to the Lower Cape permanently. So these poems that I'm going to read and that I'm delighted are in the anthology are really set down, down, further down. And the first one is called Eastham Turnips. Um, and in the, I think that the soil of the Cape was so not arable and not great farm soil but Easton became known for its turnips, which to a child wouldn't have been really exciting. But to me as an adult now, I, as an old adult, it, it, it is. Easton turnips, November. Honor system, the sign tacked to a scrub oak said, and on the table, a rusty tin box with a slot and a lid next to a pile of dirty purplish white turnips beside a battered trembly scale. Eastham turnips Eastham was once famous for, fall staple from the rocky ground, hapless settlers had no choice but to farm centuries ago, back when there were woods, before the black walnut trees were felled to build cape houses and whaling boats. The last of the turnip farm stands alongside a highway that never existed when Eastham was all farms. What else would grow here in the hard scrabble soil? Today, 
no sign or scale, just an empty table, a dead patch of grass. Trusted by strangers I never saw, I liked folding soft George Washingtons to the slot for history's sake and bringing root vegetables home and finding recipes to make the bitter delicious gratins, frittatas, soups. And this, this poem, you know, every once in a while the sea coughs up an old shipwreck and this poem was about such a shipwreck on the beach in Wellfleet at 2008. And I, th I think it must have been December when, when we walk, walked out to, to see this shipwreck, Wellfleet, 2008. Sweet carcass of an ark, the past's open oaken belly, what the sands had buried a storm uncovered high on Newcomb Hollow Beach, a hull, round wooden pegs, tool marks that tell its series, series age, ribs like the bony cage of a great white whale washed up on the shoals a decade after the Civil War. A schooner, archeologists say, converted to a barge. They think she carried coal up the Atlantic coast from an impoverished post-war South coal that washed ashore on the outer cape to the hard scrabble townspeople's shivering relief. In a few weeks, they're sure the tides will resettle her. She'll be washed back out to sea or she'll merge again, fill the coarse sand, till the coarse sand's shifting between your feet. Homely, heavy, sea scoured. Why should she seem a venerable thing, spiritual, why should you long to touch her, to shred, stretch out under the March sun in the long, smooth, silvery frame of a cradle or curl like an orphaned animal on the hand-cut planks and caress the marks, the trunnels with your mittened paws? Is it that she hints much, yet tells little of the souls lost with her? the mystery of survival, the depths she's traveled? Has she heard the music on the ocean floor, instrumentation of mantis shrimp, the bong bong of humming fish? Why does the day all blues and grays feel transcendental? She's a remnant, a being almost completely effaced, yet to you still resonant. Can anything this gone be consecrated. Experts have examined the braille of her hull, weighed the evidence and they declare, it's another secret the ocean burped up. Nothing but a blip, a brief reappearance, once rowdy, rough with purpose, now not even a container, holding nothing, revealing nothing. But aren't you also a singular secret nature burped up, hurled flailing into the air from the start, hungry for light, holding onto whatever buoys you, alive, kicking, even when you know you're going down? Thank you. Well, Gail, Gail thank you. I'm so glad that you were here to read those two poems. And just so you know, the East End Public Library has a uh, turnip festival and on their website, they give you a countdown to how many hours until you get to the turnip festival where the whole town celebrates turnips. So I think your poem, which you should know uh, at other readings, Robin Smith Johnson, who grew up near to East End in Orleans, she um, always reads it and, and people love it. And the, the shipwreck poem is, again, it's so nuanced and so finely wrought. We were just so pleased that you were willing to share those poems with us in, in the book. So thank you. Thank you. And our next poet is um, Keith Althaus. Keith. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm glad. Gail is here too. And I hope she got to see my granddaughter, Zella. She's gone now, but she was here for a little bit. 
Um, this poem's called Late Bus, Provincetown. It has an epigraph. What did we want from our lives? Someone has taken the question mark and hammered it back into a stick. Just as they have straightened the roads whose very turning is their beauty. Recently on the side of a building on the town wharf, a local photographer has installed four large black and white panels, close-ups of old Portuguese women, fishermen's wives. They look out all day, all night on the harbor, listen to the town hall bell after the last bus has arrived and departed and the last couple has passed under or around the lamp posts, cones of light. The faces are meant to stir within us both a sense of the tragic frailty and the harshness of life made bearable only by the beauty of courage and sacrifice. Unlike the granite monument on top of the hill, which feels the wind and rain and snow intermittently. These faces are exposed every day to the spray of the surf and are soaked by the tides below. Already they've been taken down twice for repair and restoration. Yet their eyes never blink or close like a doll's laid on its back. They do not look but stare at everything. The breakwater, floats, gulls, the fleet coming in, trailing clouds of bird life, raucous, joyful as a sudden whirlwind of litter on a corner in the city. And this other poem uh, is called From the Pilgrim Monument. And I wrote it years ago for my friend, Roger Skillings, and uh, who just died last year, so. The climb is breathtaking. The view roughly medieval. On one side, the town's boat-filled harbor and traffic-clogged streets. On the other, graveyards, mute and still, stretching to the edge of the moon-like dunes, forever changing, shifting, being taken away. The tallest one already halved since we arrived here 30 years ago. And nothing added or put back except beach grass planted to slow the process and a little dust, ashes of friends who loved it here and wanted to stay or go wherever it is going. Thank you. Well, wow, Keith, no, thank you. Both of those poems, they really capture the spirit of Provincetown. Um, and when we were uh, selecting poems, we knew that we were going to get a lot about Provincetown because a lot of people associate that with the Cape, but um, those two really uh, capture it. And we thank you for your poems. And our next um, poet is Howie Fierstein, who I got to meet in Truro, who is from um, Western Mass. So Howie. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for 
having my poem in this beautiful, wonderful anthology. I wrote it um, after a workshop I took with Martha Collins at the Fine Arts Work Center a bunch of years ago. And again, it's called Provincetown. There were mulberry limbs twined with mimosa branches leaning close to the back door. Stretching, I could barely reach the fruit hanging high above a narrow path. Mulberries for breakfast, mulberries with lunch, our teeth stained that whole week. Each of us believed the other was dreaming. Imagination wasn't necessary. Late afternoons, we took the small crooked side streets leading to the harbor, passing scrolled awnings and furled flags, porches intaglioed by purple morning glories, a raft of eider ducks with their black bellies and white backs visible from the bleached wharf. It was July 4th, nearing dusk, when we joined the promenade up Commercial Street. Couples arm in arm, men with men, women with women, women with men, the smell of mud at low tide, a street musician playing a Bach suite on her viola, an elegantly dressed woman sang from Carmen in faulty French. Down one clamshell alleyway, I thought I heard a Bob White's whistled call, perhaps answering those first explosions. Long Point Light and Pilgrim Monument, always in the distance. The mast of the schooner, Rose Dorothea, threatening to rise through the library steeple. And at every open space between crowded shops, at every corner, fireworks erupting. The children's moon at first quarter, as the sun dropped lower, already the days beginning to shorten. Once we reach the West End breakwater, we forgot everything. That's what we told each other. Imagination wasn't necessary, each of us believing the other was dreaming. Then we swung round and strolled back, stopping in a painter's studio where a show was being hung. The artist said, I don't want to know what I'm painting. But every move she'd made had intention. Every step we took, the bleeding berries, Bob White calling its mate, light tumbling off ringed constellations, each star in the ladder tipping over, spilling song, filling the darkness that finally stretches over land's end, the bursting flame over half the world. Thank you. Oh, that's wonderful to hear you read it. It's a prose poem for people who don't have the book to, to see it. And um, again, you know, you captured that, that wonderful spirit of Provincetown with the pacing and the, the language. So we were very grateful to have it. And um, those of us who live on the Upper Cape, which is the three editors, were saying if we get one more Provincetown poem, the whole book is going to sink into the sea. <laughs> Almost Provincetown. But we, we, um, appreciate all of the dimensions of the outer cape. So thank you for your poem. Thank you. And our next poet is um, Susan Jo Russell. Susan Jo. Thanks, Allison. Just thanks for this amazing book and, and this lovely afternoon. I'm sitting here in Provincetown, looking out towards where the sunset will be. And um, so you get one more Provincetown poem. Um, one thing about Provincetown is I feel like the air and the water and the earth are very close together here with um, sort of the membranes between them are very thin. So this poem is called Membrane. Macmillan Pier, Provincetown. The cormorant dives under the boardwalk where boys four abreast take up its breadth jostle and slouch, jeans drop to the ass, skin itchy, ready to molt. They're helpless to grasp what they're breaking out of into. While four girls, tasteful bikinis, streaming hair, poise on the edge of the pier, on a dare they rise, haughty and sleek on their toes, bare backs to the water, as if on a signal, arcs of four bodies pierce the air and everything stops. Boys, old ladies, toddlers, mothers, cries of the gull, boats in the harbor, wind strewn, moon pale in its orbit, 
caught at the moment of flight and everyone's flying and everyone's sinking into the quiet, into the danger until splashes, laughter, four heads bobbing like seals in the harbor and it all cranks up, the afternoon warms, the moon climbs higher, boys shamble on, punching shoulders, old ladies stroll to the end of the boardwalk where the cormorant rises. Thank you so much. Oh, Susan Joe, that's wonderful. Again, it's such a, a beautiful picture of the exuberance of youth, you know. Um, and we um we um did not the truth of the matter is all the poems in Provincetown needed to be in the book. <laughs> it's such a, 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 a wonderful place, whether it's the carnival that was in Howie's poem or the the kids diving off on the Pier. appearance. It's, it's wonderful uh, to have it, have your poem. And our next several readers, two, three readers will also be in Provincetown, but then, then um, each of those will have a different aspect. Uh, the next reader is Kathy Desjardins. Kathy. Hi, thank you. I just wanted to thank you, um... Rich and, and Robin and Alice for the, this labor of love. It just is such a privilege to be part of it. Thank you so much. Um, so there's some typecasting in my poem because <clears throat> if you had high school friends, you'll know that my name Desjardins means of the garden. And this is, uh, it's a real affinity for me. Gardens and poetry are really braided together as they were for um, Stanley Kunitz to whom this uh, poem is dedicated. It's called Stanley's Garden for Stanley Konitz, 1905 to 2006. <clears throat> Keeping the ocean on my left, I wended through Provincetown the summer after he died, past the landscape galleries, roller skating drag queens, the ice cream and t-shirt shops and hand-carried dogs with apologetic eyes to a quieter part of town. I didn't know if I could find his house, but there was the rusty gate. Here were the good bones of the stone terraces he built, hauling loads of seaweed from the beach half a century ago. I'd imagined it as somber, overgrown since he died, but the leaves and petals shimmied in the sunlight his beloved wind anemones swaying gently. All, all was nearly vibrating with joy. He caressed these plants just as the one time I met him and read him a poem. He took my face gently in his hands, a poet a hundred years old, touching me as if I were a flower. Thank you. <laughs> Kathy, thank you so much. And I remember when we were both at a Fine Arts Work Center workshop with Fred yes. Marchand, mm -hmm. who also has a poem in the book. And I heard you read uh, maybe an earlier draft of this poem, but it's so touching that mm -hmm. we have a poem that in tribute to uh, Stanley Kunitz, and we have another poem in the book that's a tribute to Mary Oliver by people who heard her read. Um, so it's it's a it's good that the, the book starts with Stanley Kunitz, and that your poem sort of echoes that another aspect of the poet, the gardener. So thank you, Kathy. And our next poet is Diane Lockwood. Diane. Diane, you might have to unmute, I think. Now, everything brilliant that I said you couldn't hear. <laughs> I'll just start over. I said thank you for including me in the book and in this reading. As I was listening to all of these wonderful poems, I kept thinking how much the book and the poems are touched um, by painting. Um, and uh, different images of painting in particular works and artists. And my poem also feels that influence of both uh, the 
Provincetown, particularly the Fine Arts Work Center and uh, painting. I went to the Fine Arts Work Center, I believe six years in a row and took a one week workshop each summer uh, with a different poet. And they would have readings at night, I suppose they still do. And one night of the week they would have, or maybe it was every night of the week, they would um, pair up an artist, a visual artist with uh, the, the poetry uh, readers and prose readers also. And some of the imagery in my poem comes from the art show that I saw one week while I was there. And I was having a conversation with a bunch of poets and I remember asking them why so many painters came to Provincetown. And the one poet said, they come for the light. And I, I loved what she said. I thought that was so beautiful. And I kept that idea with me and a number of other things that happened that week. And when I went up to the Frost Place in Franconia, New Hampshire, I took the images with me, but there's where I sat down and uh, wrote the poem. So here it is, The Properties of Light. It begins with an epigraph from Mark Doty's memoir, Heaven's Coast. Isn't the whole world heaven's coast? The properties of light. I come for the light, the artist says. Dawn and again at sunset, he goes to the Provincetown beach, sets up his easel. At just the right angle, he can catch that light on the canvas. He uses words like shimmer, glow, radiance. He talks about what our forefathers must have seen when they woke that first dawn just off the coast. He darkens the room, lights up the wall with his slides. We see not the play of light against dark, but the play of light against light. We see it in the rocks, the beached whale, the bones of dead fish. In the last days of my father's life, he kept calling me, Elaine, Elaine, even though I was in the next room or the same room and he didn't need or want anything. He kept doing it. If I answered, he'd know he was still alive. If I didn't, he was dead. The last time he called, he held out his hand, all blue veins and bones now. His head fell back and the skin on his face smoothed out. What I remember is the light, how it slipped into the room and took him. In that moment, the light was different. And I saw my father as I had never seen him before, young, full of wonder and in no pain at all. Thank you. Well, thank you, Diane. I have to tell you that that poem was so moving. Um, I immediately you know, could, could picture what you're talking about with the properties of light. Um, one of the themes in the book that reappears is about painters, but also that the certain places on the Cape um, and on the vineyard and on Nantucket, it's as though the light loves the land because mm -hmm. they, the, there's scrub pine, but there's not the, the deep forest that really sort of is between the sky and the earth. And um, that we had your poem and then we had a poem by Mark Doty um, in Long Point Light right next to each other. That was wonderful too. Mm -hmm. so thank you so much. And we have another poem that is also set in Provincetown and also about painters. And it's by a longtime uh, poet friend of mine, Jennifer Markell, who graciously set up this reading for us with the New England Poetry Club. So Jennifer. Thank you, Alice, and everyone for being here and for um, including my poem in the anthology. It's I've been reading it slowly and savoring it, and um, I'm learning a lot about the Cape, um, which I've been coming to since summer camp when I was nine, but I'm still learning from this anthology, all the different facets. Um, so this poem was also 
originally inspired by the Fine Arts Work Center where, I, and I honestly can't remember who the instructor was, but they said, go watch some painters paint. So we um, spread out and watch the painters. Landscape with Painters, Provincetown, Massachusetts. Undeterred by record heat, they've come to paint the marsh, donning straw hats and baseball caps. The class spreads out with aprons, crimped tubes of oils, Pringle cans to hold the brushes. Three-legged easel, gangly as a heron, straddles water and land. The red-headed woman begins with a grid. She charts the marsh like a sailor embarking on a voyage, finds lavender in a seagull's wing, saffron in a fallen feather. A barefoot man leans into the shade of an acacia. His palette is a clock of color, cerulean at 11, carmen at six. By noon, the marsh will fill again. The sun casts deeper shades of blush and brown and in between colors they keep trying to capture. Thank you. Well, oh, thanks, Jennifer. I love that poem. And um, I can see it and I can savor it. Um, and uh, we, I did a little research on why the Provincetown, why Provincetown became such an art colony. And we never got a poem about it, but it was really, it helped that the Cape Cod Railroad, uh, it brought, it connected the artists from New York to Provincetown more quickly than coming by, by boat, so, or ship. So, um, you know, if we do a volume two, somebody has to write um, about the Cape Cod Railroad and its influence. And I know, you know, we also realized we omitted the Cape Cod Baseball League, and we certainly know that maybe a, a poet might be a baseball fan and might do us a favor and write about the Cape Cod baseball league. But you know the 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 painting, uh, the painters on on the outer Cape they they flock there for a really good reason because it is so supportive an environment. They support each other just like the poets do at the Fine Arts Work Center. So thank you. And um, we're about to hop over to Martha's Vineyard, and we have a. A poet um, from the vineyard who will read um, his poems in the book, Donald Nietzsche. Hi, Alice. Thank you. And thank you, Rich and Robin. And um, it's so great to put faces to every to the poems. Um, yeah, so uh, I'm going to read a poem about the sports rivalry between um, Martha's Vineyard and Nantucket, which is also one of the few opportunities that the Islanders have to um, see each other because it's not that easy to go back and forth. This is called Martha's Vineyard versus Nantucket. Not much between us. Their 200 pound linemen are tailback like a greased pig. Their winters even longer than our own our superiority of trees. Same wind-blasted sand dunes and canceled boats. Same tackles and cheerleaders sired by tackles and cheerleaders. Same empty roads that lead nowhere. Same solitude we thought was all ours. Some stick around, some go long and don't look back. Some stumble into trouble and break free, some don't. Like fraternal twins separated at birth, we don't recognize each other, barely speak, but knock each other down to see who gets up first. As the winners or losers line up for the shuttle to the flight or ferry ride home, the home team waves or turns their backs and everyone who has one leans on their car horns. And I'm gonna read one more poem about, I, I write a lot of poems about the off season. This is about the um, infamous bar in Oak Bluffs called the Ritz. 
happy hour at the Ritz Cafe. The season, which is over, burrows into itself like a mole in the lawn. The rich have departed. Defeat permeates the room. This week's cases in district court huddle along the bar, plotting their next Mark Lane violations, class T possessions, insert your crime here. Our resident smuggler, an unemployed hustler, orbits three house cleaners in tightening circles. Trophy homes rule the horizon, flotsam left high by departing tides as we second and third homeless crouch in their shadows and cry in our beers. Contra contractor husbands just on my way home, Circuit Ave regulars, charmers, pub crawlers, all are drawn in to the stifling warmth of their own kind, the flushed cheeks and vacant stares of the marathon spongers propped up on bar stools like exhibit A also rans. Don't forget the barmaid, she calls this shipwreck home and banned for life, our favorite retrobate and local hero who swears he stormed the sands at Normandy, hot foots it out on the sidewalk like the class clown, making faces at us all. He's the joke we get too well, calling us to scale the castle walls, send the nobles packing. The class war begins tonight, but first there's this scalloper on my right, egging for a fight. He doesn't care with whom. Thank you. Oh, that's great, Donald. And yes, you have two more poems in the book, uh, but you picked one that I was hoping you would read, which is in the final section of the book, it's called Off Season, We Live Here. And it's so wonderful that, um, you know, we have some poems also about the, the not, you know, picture postcard parts of the cave. And uh, Donald did a, a lovely thing and he uh, hosted a reading for us on Martha's Vineyard. And um, Megan Quinn, who um, is in the, well, she lives, she, she works in Falmouth, but she lives off Cape. She did a poem called In the Back Booth of Bobby Burns Pub, which was a, a real, real um, tribute to the recovery community, which is very strong. That's a it. great poem, yeah. <laughs> so it was great to get the, Donald and Megan together who hadn't met. So hopefully that's what we'll continue to do is connect all the dots. But it is good to hear you read it out loud. I love that poem. And I actually asked if you would submit it because I always remember it from Thank when you. we read at Calliope. So this is great. Um, our next poet is Richard For Forster. Uh, and I would... Um, uh, he also has a poem set on the venue. So Richard, could you read your poem? I will, thank you. And Alice, Rich, Robin, you know, it's a delight to have this poem in this beautiful book. Uh, I wrote it over 30 years ago now after two visits um, to Martha's Vineyard. And alas, I haven't been back, though I've been to the Cape many times. Um, if I have to describe it, I'd say it's, it's exuberantly whimsical. Uh, especially in the way the, the metaphors are, are sometimes, when I look back on it, a bit overdone, but um, here it is. Gayhead, one. Thanks to the Wampanoag's studied indifference, we've breached the first defense of individuality and perhaps the last as well. Our rainbow of Izod Lacostes and Calvin Kleins, all the class marks of the vineyard's summer tribe and go about blissfully in the buff. For what is flesh between friends or strangers if we can doff restraint for an afternoon with all the flourish of a satin cape? But not D, who still demure in his boxers, wearing propriety like a penitential hair shirt. 
He talks of shame as something woven on a loom, shuttling across the generations. It's always seemed a threadbare gift from a disappointed God, or so the priests have said in their embroidering. But here, shame flutters on the skin like an airy chiffon, or at worst, like the sudden chill you get when you think you've locked your keys inside the house, and there you are, feeling doltish in a business suit because you fear the neighbors may be snickering in the zebra light of their living rooms. Two, impermanent as history, this gaudy pentimento oozes into the Atlantic and the August light, its record of eucalyptus leaves and camel bones. Abrasive as pumice in the dry sun, it cools to putty in an after rain a rich prismatic mulch of ferric reds and saffron ochre of gray primordial mornings and basalt nights. The first seamen with all their mispacked luggage from home anemically named this headland Dover Cliffs. Should we be glad that faith like theirs erodes, that the monochromatic certainties refract and are revised, howsoever diminished and diminishing, like this gay and splendid hemi canyon at the lap of the lapis tide. Three, by easing ourselves into the sun warm mud and wallowing like Serengeti beasts, we become criminals of leisure, environmental threats. But this is the sacrament we've come for, to transubstantiate flesh into stone, to feel the suck of the earth draw us back, to hear the quickening sand whisper Aquina, the true name, to emerge naked but clothed, knowing what all those puzzled, mud-daubed faces in the primitive exposures of our dog-eared magazines were saying to us about crime and shame. And finally, to shiver with this light, and dissolve like mist in the waves. Four, the old gent we saw two years ago shuffled by just now. The same weary pack horse burdened, as you said, with the largest penis in Christendom. It's still an oddity despite his easy pride outmoded as a pendulum. For where's his wife? Remember her skirted in a wisp of kelp an iodine stain that concealed nothing, least of all the decades that tugged at her breasts. That summer, at his side, she cradled an armful of shells as if she were hoarding all the hours of childhood to be gleaned from this beach. How we chuckled at them, still girdled in the taut confidence of our middle age. And so here he is now, alone, Wearing, can I imagine it, neither sorrow nor defiance, but a calm acceptance of release into a life as malleable as clay. He's become something runnelled with the years that have washed over him since he first wandered here with her. And to think we thought them ridiculous, going hand in hand in the soapstone light of these weathered cliffs. Thank you so much. Well, so wonderful and wonderful to hear you read it in such a uh, real celebration of the human body. It was wonderful to read it the first time we, we saw it and to know that we could get to hear you read it. That's so great. We really appreciate it, your poem. Thank you for having me here. And I um, just want to say that we're not going to neglect Nantucket. Uh, that would be, you know, talk about uh, not getting the, the challenge of um, Martha's Vineyard versus Nantucket. And there will be at some point a reading on Nantucket. Um, and as Gail Mazur reminds us, probably not in April, which is the coolest month. And um, it's also National Poetry Month, which makes it sometimes very cool for poetry organizers. But sometime next season, we'll do Nantucket. But to represent Nantucket, we have Mary Pfister. Mary. You may need to unmute. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, good. Um, oh, what a lovely afternoon. I, I feel really privileged to be part of this. And thank you so much for including, including this poem in your gorgeous anthology. Um, 
This poem takes place out on Wawinet. Um, my late husband and I, and eventually our daughter, uh, would go in middle two weeks of June. Uh, we didn't like the crowds and um, it was so far out. We always had to take the ferry. So, you know, we had to make the reservation for that in January. So it, it, it just felt like Winter was never going to be that long because we had the ferry reservation and we take the 7 a.m. ferry and uh, have to leave Western Mass at four in the morning and it, it felt like we were running away and um, we just did that year after year at once we found this place we just never went anywhere else. Um, so that's where that's where this poem takes place. Nantucket Bluff. Someone must have said it so, this lone Adirondack chair on a whiskered bluff where sea blots sky beyond the veer. How many visits to get the angle right? There had to be a giving over as sand echoed off its splintered legs until the chair sunk no more and anyone could lean, then lean back watch shells buff to porcelain? Or was it tossed like so much rack and spawn, bladders of kelp, the sea a rigging of scallop, shuck, and straw? And one of the lone beachcomber dallying here at the bottleneck waist of the sandbar during low tide, she walks through brief tidal pools, Eddies rush her like runoff, mollusks scribble beneath sand. Her tracks fill in with Octuruses drift, risen, glinting. Well, thank you so much, Mary. And um, it sort of uh, is the one of the echoes to Robin Smith Johnson's poem about walking a beach with her son, about all the things you find uh, that um, was you know, beautiful sound in that poem. So we really fell in love with it when we would read the poems out loud around our dining room table. So thank you. And our next poet um, is actually uh, zooming in from Maine. And uh, she also has a poem in the off season, we live here section, Valerie Lawson, Valerie. Thank you so much, Alice. And it's such a pleasure to be a part of this project. I, I adored living on the Cape. And um, I have to say that all these poems are making me very homesick. <laughs> so thank you for that. Um, yeah, I chose the off season and uh, the poem is Winter Rental, which if you live on the Cape, you know that winter rentals are equal parts godsend and nuisance. You know, you, you just never know who's gonna fetch up in these homes. And if you have neighbors who are winter rentals, you just never know what's going to happen. And, and you know, I have known people who have just, having a winter rental has been, has saved their lives because they were able to live somewhere until they could catch up to themselves and, and recover or whatever. So anyway, the poem. The last surge carried the cottage across the street. It lay canted, a 50-foot sloop leaning on it like a drunken sailor, rigging caught in the weather vane. Cleared of wreckage and reset on FEMA-rated pilings, its defiant windows still face the sea. Perched on jacks, a half-scraped boat waits for spring. When the bad storms come, watchers often find one, passed out cold at the high water mark. Winter rental folk, drawn to the hearth in the off-season, stay until rugosa roses peel off scratchy winter hips and send out pale green shoots. Offshore, the seals sing their faraway songs, their bobbing heads shining like stars in the belly of a wave. There is a season before storm, when screen door styles gently kiss the casing, the hinges quiet, the spring untested. Come foul weather, the unlatched door is the first to go, catching relentless winds, flying like a kite without a tail. Thank you. Oh, that's great. Um, I can see it and I can see <laughs> it. And um, yes, winter rentals, um, they come in handy, but they do tend to end. <laughs> 
with the Heidelberg season. And I just wanted to just uh, thank Valerie. When we first started to think about this book, Rich and I and Robin, we reached out to Valerie for advice. Uh, she's done an anthology, Three Nations, a Three Nations anthology set in the Maine with the, uh, Valerie, you have to help me here with the Native uh, clubs. Yep, that, Native Canadian and New England authors. And I heard uh, a, a reading at Mass Poetry and I knew that, you know, I knew yeah, Valerie from her off the coast editing. So yeah. it was great to reach out and get some great advice on how to be inclusive and what to do. <laughs> Just muted myself. Somehow my my computer keeps buzzing and I've turned off all my devices, so I don't know what magic that is. So the um the last poet to read before I end the reading with the Mary Oliver poem is Jennifer Rose, and this is where all the dots get connected. The very first poetry reading I did through a chapter and verse in Jamaica Plain, I had the pleasure of reading with Jennifer Rose. So I had her book of poems um, and we were so grateful to um, be able to include one of uh, Jennifer Rose's poems in the anthology. Jennifer. Thank you, Alice, and, and to all the editors um, and the other readers. What a lovely, lovely afternoon. Feels like we all got to spend it on the Cape, even if uh, we're not there physically. Uh, this is an off-season uh, poem called East End Postcard, and it's from Provincetown in December. I love the mosaic these shacks make as they gerrymander the air for their views of the harbor. Some tiptoe on stilts right down to the water, precarious as drag queens in 50s stilettos. An unleashed Labrador studies the jetties. Laundry lines shiver with year-rounders skivvies. At night, Route 6 wears a fabulous topaz necklace on the decollete bay. The marina, a tiara of lights near where I stay. What life might I live were I brave enough to love the right woman? Hourly, all of us fall in the circle of P-Town Soul Church Bell, the gulls, quaint cottages of lovers and me. Time has no tourists, unlike the sea, or love, although unwillingly. Thank you. Oh, that's wonderful to hear you read it. And the, the book it's from, which is Hometown for, for, for an Hour, I believe, is full of postcard poems, which put you right in that place so that we were so grateful to have that in the anthology. So I'm going to end the reading. Um, I suppose I need to, I am unmuted. You can all hear me with um, a Mary Oliver poem. This is the poem that ends the book. And, uh, I wanted to ask you, have you forgotten Brooks and Martha's Vineyard and Ellie and Martha's Vineyard? Oh, are you? Oh, I'm sorry. Did I forget you? I didn't realize that. I, th I sent out the list of readers, so I am terribly sorry. Um, whose poem then would go first, either Ellie or um, Brooks? Mine is about Ann, um, Ann Vanderhoop, who is a, um, a Wampanoag. Um, her family runs a, uh, a restaurant, which is all the way at the end of the vineyard in Aquina. So she's a lovely person. Let me read about her. Anne Vanderhoop, a lady deeply still. She sits on a stool at her tourist shop, perched above the clay cliffs, active in silence, amused by the commerce. For a minute, I see through her eyes past an old family inn, half hidden in the grasses under hill's curve, where a shoreline snakes east to the horizon. Its dunes not yet burnished, the water warm, still but roiled by a hurricane paths passing south. I look into a universe tourists come for, but never take home, because it is hers, and she is part of it, 
the beauty without words of another world that I want to. She lives as if it is contained within a globe at her center, made of sand, grasses, cranberry bogs, herring runs, sky colors, and the always shifting sea. Thank you. Oh, well, thank you, Brooks, for, um, I'm so sorry that I overlooked you. I think I had uh, too many emails going on at once when I printed off the order of readers. And did I forget somebody else? Ellie Bates. Oh, Ellie Bates. Her poet. Okay, Ellie, would you read your poem? I'm very happy to listen. I am not in this anthology, but uh, maybe someday the Cleveland House poets here on Martha's Vineyard will read from their new collection. But I, I am not. Uh, I am not in your anthology, unfortunately. But uh, it's a beautiful book, and. Uh, I also loved the time, Alice, I think you came to the West Tisbury uh, Library to, or no, maybe Chilbark, which one? Anyway, to, to uh, share your work on um, Board Bridge. Yeah, all right. No, thank you. What a great anthology. I have my copy. <laughs> um, thank you. Oh, and, thank you. And please give um, my regards to Fan Ogilvy, who also- I Yeah. Know Yes. Yes, and um, I know that we uh, they interviewed both uh, us and the uh, editors of the, the new Cleveland House anthology. And what's the name of that anthology? Uh, in the Company of Poets. Oh, great. Okay. Yeah. That's wonderful. It's it's wonderful when all of the uh, the poets can come together as one community. And I've often said that when I visit the vineyard, I always feel like it has such a strong poetry community. We definitely do. <laughs> so um, if I haven't um, missed somebody, I'm going to read Mary Oliver and then uh, tell you again where you can um, get the book. I'm just going to unmute it. So here we go. So this is the last poem in the book. It's Mary Oliver's Coming Home. When we're driving in the dark on the long road to Provincetown, which lies empty for miles, when we're weary, when the buildings and the scrub pine lose their familiar look, I imagine us rising from the speeding car. I imagine us seeing everything from another place, the top of one of the pale dunes or the deep and nameless fields of the sea. And what we see is the world that cannot cherish us, but which we cherish. And what we see is our life moving like that, along the dark edges of everything, the headlights like lanterns sweeping the blackness, believing in a thousand fragile and unprovable things, looking out for sorrow, slowing down for happiness, making all the right turns, right down to the thumping barriers to the sea, the swirling waves, the narrow streets, the houses, the past, the future, the doorway that belongs to you and me. So that's, that's the way the book ends. And um, to start with Stanley Kunitz and end with Mary Oliver, what could be better than that? Um, and I, I'm just going to change the view to gallery so I can see you all and just thank all the contributors and all this has been such a wonderful afternoon of poetry and um, the book is um, available for the contributors with their discount through the um, um, Bass River Press link on the Cultural Center of Cape Cod and I know it's in the chat but just go to the Cultural uh, Center of Cape Cod um, and it's right on their homepage and it'll take you in, and it'll give you instructions. If you want multiple books, you have to call because of the postage, but they have a, a core of volunteers that really have helped send the book out. And uh, Jennifer's showing us the book, which is great. And um, the, uh, if you're anywhere, you, you, 
an independent bookseller can order directly through Ingram. And one of our booksellers here in Mashpee checked with the warehouse and they have plenty of copies. So there shouldn't be a, a shortage for the holidays. And, um, you know, I, I want to again thank Jennifer Markell for setting this up uh, for us. And um, we are thinking about doing some readings next season, one of which we hope would be a, um, a benefit for one of the conservation uh, nonprofits on the Cape. That really is one of the themes in the book, the fragility and preciousness of the land. Um, I think, you know, uh, Lorna talked about both homes could go underwater, but the place has changed. And what we really hoped for with this book is that it would be a legacy, that 50 years from now, somebody could find this book in a public library and they would say, oh, that's what the Cape and Islands were like. So each of you is a part of that legacy. And I really, truly want to thank you all, and especially Jennifer. Thank you, Alice. You just gave me the chills <laughs> with uh, the idea of somebody picking up a book in 50 years and discovering the Cape that way. Yeah. Thank you so much. It was a wonderful afternoon. Thank everybody who read and attended. And uh, on to the Cape. Yeah. And as my mother used to say about tourists, she'd say the Cape should have a sign that says stay home, but send money. But we do all welcome you to come over the bridge and enjoy the Cape and the islands. Um, because really, you know, it's a great place to visit and to live. So thank you all. Rich and Robin, do you want it to have anything to say? You want to close off? No, I just want to thank everyone. Um, it was so so wonderful to hear, um, to attach names to poems, but to hear everyone read their own poems. It was just a great, great afternoon. So thank you. And thank you, Jennifer and the New England Poetry Club. It was great. And I'd like to add that um, I feel closer now to the poets and to their poems. And it's been um, really a great experience. Thank you so much for coming. Mm -hmm. Thank you all.